This is a story about a special kind of noise. A noise worth a small fortune. A noise that has made a provincial city, for a time at least, the metropolis of pop music. This is the story of the Mersey Sound. Oh, there must be about 300 or so rock and roll groups in Liverpool, and all of them except us have either signed up for record companies or, or with the telly or something like that. You've only got to mention Liverpool, and all the fans start screaming and going wild. It's glamour, but I mean, when you weigh it up, it's rather ironic to think that there's 80,000 houses in Liverpool itself, which are really not fit for people to live in. And apart from that, there's uh, about twice as many people on the dole here as anywhere else in the country. Yes, but it is a good thing, the fact that they are on the dole, as far as they can spend all day practicing, whereas if they had a normal job, they wouldn't be able to do that at all. Oh, in fact, one chap used to play with us, he was on off the dough for about five years and all. But seriously, there's loads of vitality and talent ready to break out of Liverpool any time at all. They're not fighting, they're singing. And up to a couple of years ago, the police wouldn't let them sing at all in the pubs in case they started a riot. <laughs> People seem to be saying there's no Mersey sound, but there definitely is a sound. It, it's a sound of its own. It, it's a sound that you don't find anywhere else in the country. I'd say that the Mersey side sound is a heavy accent on the bass drum and the bass guitar. And that's what gives the music its guts. Probably the nearest definition is a hard driving beat with a chunk chunk on the drums. The first thing you hear is the bass, the thump, thump, thump of the bass. It just seems to... It's just absolutely fantastic. It vibrates the whole inside of you. I mean, say, I've, I've been with groups that are practicing in small places. The, actual, the bass actually rattles the windows. This is exactly what it does to a human, human being, I think. They don't sing pretty songs. They sing real songs, real feeling as they turn out. Just pure feeling for these Liverpool noises. I don't think there is any, any such thing as a Mersey sound. It's, it's just an illusion that now Liverpool groups have broken through and got records up in the charts. So people have just said this sort of thing. I think it's purely geographical. Uh, if they play the sort of music in Timbuktu, they would call it a Timbuktu sound. If they played it in uh, Plymouth, they'd call it the Plymouth sound. Well, it's a form of rowdyism, really. When you start in this business, as we might call it, you, you're really on your own. You buy a guitar, maybe a couple of pounds, second-hand one or a new one. You, you sort of go into it every night. You take every available minute you've got to play it and practice it just on your own until you feel that you, you're uh, um, capable enough to maybe get a couple of pals together and get a group. I bought a second-hand kit of drums. I used to practice in the in the in the garage down the, the garden, you know, and I borrowed some money off my grandfather to buy a better kit of drums, you know. My mother said, well, go to lessons. So go to lessons I did, but uh, after learning about three chords, I learned nothing more. So I, I gave that up and uh, 
had a bash at listening to records instead, and um, I learnt more that way. Well, the main problem isn't music, it's people, actually. Uh, when we started uh, playing a group, we had to find somewhere to practice. Well, we started practicing in various homes, and we had to put up with the parents complaining, especially the father who works nights. Then the neighbours started thumping on the wall, and uh, finally they got a petition up and sent the council round to uh, tell us that, well, if you didn't stop practicing and making noise, and we'd get thrown out, probably. When I first got my first kid, I used to practice in the parlour all night, and the lady next door used to bang on the wall, because of the noise, you see, well, I just used to get up off the drums and bang back on the wall, and, of course, she wouldn't say anything else, you know, she'd just get fed up knocking on the wall. Whoa, come on! One singer we were playing with, we hadn't been started, we hadn't been going long as a group. And we did the first half of the show and it was, it was so so, it was pretty dead really. So uh, we said, oh, we'll have to do something about this. So we took him off to the boozer, you see. And um, not being a drinking fellow, you see, the drink affected him rather more than we expected. We went on stage and he started throwing his arms about, getting twisted in the microphone cable. And as a result of that, it became part of his act. And now he's coming down like a bomb wherever he goes. Especially in the dance halls, not particularly the jazz clubs, um, people would come in to the dance about half past nine, having spent a couple of hours in the in the pub. They come in, usually start over two blokes fighting over one girl. Um, because eventually the whole dance hall erupted. And it was just a mass of violence. There'd be chairs throwing around, cups going, every blood everywhere. The police might be standing outside the door. They wouldn't venture in. They weren't going to risk their necks. The group would just have to keep playing on all the time. But uh, now with more and more bouncers and better bouncers, or perhaps wrestlers and boxers and all kinds of things like that at these uh, joints, the, the crowd's so packed and so hot, they're just too tired and too tightly packed to raise a fist to start a fight. <laughs> Most of the groups are in it for fun, not for money. By the time, they get about eight pound per booking. By the time we've paid off the driver and so on, you're lucky if you've got about four pound a week between you. And that goes into your higher purchase. Um, as for example, my own group, for instance, spent about 1,100 pounds worth in equipment. Um, it's taken us two years to pay it off. By the time it will be paid off, it will be uh, past the post and we need new equipment. Pretend you're happy when you're blue. The groups expect to struggle along at first, but in fact, with that, it is big business. For instance, since last September, we've enrolled at just one club in the heart of the city, 15,000 members who pay half a crown for a year's membership, and we try to give them good value for money. For instance, on this club alone, they spent in the region of 5,000 pounds on decorations and improvements. This club about a year ago was originally a jazz club. We had our problems, and so when we took over, we had about 40 beatniks sleeping on the floor. They smell, the good customers don't want to mix with them, and so our first problem was in getting them out. We also faced our problems with the protection boys, 
and the types that come around swinging bicycle chains and wanting to spoil other people's pleasure. This was overcome mainly with the help of our bouncers. We have a very good team. They're respected in their own districts. They know the types to keep out. And they have run the club exceptionally well for us. We leave that side entirely to them. You'll find this love you can't share. To many ears, the happiest note in the Mersey sound has been the tinkling of money. A pop music newspaper, which started in Liverpool two years ago with a capital of £200, now claims to sell 25,000 copies every fortnight. Its editor, Bill Harry. When we started Mersey Beat two years ago, the Beatles were tying the mics to broomsticks. They had long haircuts and rather an untidy form of dress. All over Merseyside, the groups were wearing jeans on stage, were very sloppy, um, long haircuts. Worst of all, they were actually swearing on stage. So we wrote some editorials. Get your haircut. Don't smoke on stage. Stop swearing. And um, we found that the groups did take notice. Smart suits on stage, a more professional outlook. And rock and roll became more of a major industry than just a hobby. Of course, most of this business is a high purchase, but uh, I would say that over the past two years, the general business of guitars, amplifiers and drums must have gone up fivefold. must be about a million pounds a year spent on the rock and roll industry in Merseyside. Most of it comes from the younger teenage fans, the fanatical about the groups and supporting them. The fans of the group, um, the different groups around Liverpool these days seem to be getting younger all the time. They're down to about 12 and 13 now, really. Of course, they're made up mainly of about 85% of girls. And um, the behaviour of some of them is quite fantastic. We heard a case of where some of them, in fact, slept beneath the bedroom window of one of the drummers in one of the famous groups, which I won't actually name. And uh, there again, we've seen them sleeping outside different jazz clubs when they know the particular groups on the next day. And uh, we remember on Easter Monday last year, in fact, um, when we were playing at one of these particular places in town, uh, there was a great queue there, must have been about 50 yards long, hours before the performance was due to start. And when we got down there, we were the first group on about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, all the girls rush to the front and they get a um, bird's eye view of the group and then of course when we started playing we expected they might be uh, listening to us but in point of fact out they got with their lunch and started eating and uh, doing their hair, taking their rollers out and pre preparing themselves for the group, the main group which was on about 10 o'clock you see. Yeah, it was the Beatles who were on that night and the girls had been queuing up all night and when they got in um, there must have been about 700 of them there. The Beatles come on the stage and the sweat was dripping off the walls, off the ceilings, all. Oh, the atmosphere was damp, and the sweat must have dripped onto the fuses, fused all the amplifiers, so they couldn't play. So what they done, they got the crowd joining in with them, singing, and with the, just the drums playing, all the girls singing. Then they fixed the amps, they went on, and all the girls, as soon as they come on, all the girls screaming, shouting, pushing to see them, and uh, you, you just couldn't hear any music, all you just saw them. So the girls go home, say to their mother, Oh, we heard the Beatles tonight, and matter of fact, they, they've waited about ten hours outside just to see them, never heard them at all. The Beatles came down themselves about uh, half two in the morning, three o'clock, and they were talking to us and um, signing autographs, and then they went away, and then we sort of all sat down, and some of the lazy ones sort of fell asleep, but the rest of us just kept awake on coffee and dreams of the Beatles. The Beatles. In one meteoric year, they've led the way from the cellars of Liverpool to the national limelight. George Harrison, lead guitar. John Lennon, rhythm guitar. Paul McCartney, bass guitar. Ringo Starr, drums. A group run by Liverpool businessman, Brian Epstein. 
Epstein was a house furnisher who developed a sideline in gramophone records. He got the Beatles their first record, Love Me Do, in October 1962. Its brisk sale on Merseyside helped to hoist the Beatles into the popularity charts published in the music papers. This was the beginning of a national reputation. I hadn't had anything to do with uh, pop management, management of pop artists before uh, that day that I went down to the Camping Club and heard the Beatles playing. And um, this was quite a new world, really, for me. Uh, I was amazed by this sort of dark, smoky, dank atmosphere, this beat music playing away. And um, the Beatles were then just four lads on that rather dimly lit stage, uh, somewhat ill-clad, and the presentation was, well, left a little to be desired as far as I was concerned, because I'd been interested in the theatre and acting for a long time. But amongst all that, something tremendous came over. And uh, I was immediately struck by their, their, their music, their beat, and uh, their sense of humor, actually, on stage. And even afterwards, when I met them, I was struck again by their personal charm. And uh, it was there that, really, it all started. It took about eight months to um, get to the stage where we had a recording contract and we were having um, the first record issued. And uh, from there to not the present, well, where their last record sold half a million copies within 10 days of issue. Actually, their first record did very well. It sold 100,000 copies. That was Love Me Do. The best thing was it came to the charts in two days and everybody thought it was a fiddle because our managers stores send in these what is it record things Return. returns and everybody down south thought ah oh, ha, ha he's buying them himself or he's just fiddling the charts you know but he wasn't actually we've been at it a long time before that we've been to hamburg and i think that's where we um, found our style, we developed our style because of this fellow there, he used to say, you've got to make a show for the, the people. And he used to come up every night shouting, Mac Show. So we used to Mac Show and John used to dance around like a gorilla and we'd all, you know, knock our heads together and things like that. Anyway, we got back to Liverpool and all the groups that were doing this sort of shadows type of stuff. And uh, we came back, leather jackets and jeans and funny hair, macking xiao, which went down quite well. We just bought leather jackets, not, as a, not, as, not for the group. One person bought one, I can't remember, and then we all liked them, so it ended up we were all on stage with them. And we'd always worn jeans because we didn't have anything else at the time, yeah. And then we went back to Liverpool and got a quite a few bookings, you know, they all thought we were German. You know, we're builders from Hamburg, and they all say, you speak good English, you know, things like that. So we went back to Germany, and we had a bit more money the second time. So we bought leather pants, and we looked like four Jean Vincents, only a bit younger, I think. And that was it, you know, and we just kept those, the leather gear, till Brian came along. It was a bit sort of old hat anyway, all wearing leather gear. And we decided we didn't want to look sort of ridiculous, just going on, because... It, more often than not, sort of people, too many people would laugh. It was just stupid. We didn't want to sort of appear as a gang of idiots. And Brian suggested that we just sort of wore ordinary suits. So we just got what we thought were quite good suits and just got rid of the leather gear. Yeah, that was all. So and the happened. idea was pinched anyway. Oh, yeah, I had my pants pinched anyway. We didn't laugh at it in Liverpool. We do like the fans and enjoy reading the publicity about us, but. From time to time, you don't realise that it's actually about yourself. You see your pictures and 
read articles about you know, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Paul and John, uh, but you don't actually think, oh, that's me that I am in the paper. It's, it's funny, it's just as though it's a different person. When we go home, you know, it's, we go in early in the morning when we finish the job and the kids, you know, they don't know you at home. But if they find out well, where I live, they get the drums out, you know, and beat it out. Because it's a play street and, you know, there's no traffic or nothing bothering them. And once, when the boys came for me, they popped in to see me, mum and my dad, you know. We had to go out the back because, you know, there's 20 or 30 outside. And they wouldn't believe me, Mother, you know, they'd knock in saying, can we have their autographs? So it built up, you know, so much. There was about 200 kids all around the door and they was peeping through the window and knocking, you know. And in the end, my mother was ill, you know. She was terrified out of her life, just all these kids and boys and girls and that, you know. They send us a lot of jelly babies and chocolates and things like that because just because um, somebody wrote in one of the papers uh, about presents and things that we had given to us and John said he got some jelly babies and I ate them but ever since that we've been inundated he had about two ton a night but the um, the main trouble is they, they tend to throw them at us <laughs> when we're on stage and uh, once I got one in my eye which wasn't very nice in fact I've never been the same since <laughs> it all sounds complaining that you know we're not we're just putting the point is that you know it affects your home more than it does yourself, you know, because you know what to expect. But your parents and your family, you know, they don't know what's happening. producer Jim Casey. No, well, it isn't really uh, all that funny because, um, I mean, these kids are the people who decide. They're, they're the ones who make stars or break them. I mean, if a thousand kids scream, this is fab. And if, they, if nobody screams, it's terrible, it's rotten. And that's it. <laughs> Apologize to her Be 
Because everybody is asking in the business, how long can these groups go on, this Mersey beat? Uh, nobody knows, but one thing is that the record companies have got to keep on finding new gimmicks, new things to sell, some of these 20 million pounds of the records that are sold every year. And teenagers, as they get to be 17 or whatever the age is, um, they want new idols. And groups, the other thing is that groups it seems to me difficult for them to carry on, unlike individuals, Tommy Steele and Cliff Richards, they can become entertainers, actors, dancers, singers. What a group can do, I don't know. Their future seems much more shaky. You demand that you think, how long are you going to last? Well, you can't say, you know. You can be big-headed and say, yeah, we're going to last 10 years. But as soon as you've said that, you think, you know, we're lucky if we last three months, you know. Well, obviously, we can't keep playing the same sort of music until we're about 40, because no, when we're sort of old men playing from me to you, nobody's going to want to know at all about that sort of thing. So, we, you know, we've thought about it, and probably the thing that John and I will do uh, will be write songs as we have been doing, as a sort of sideline now. We'll probably develop that a bit more, we hope. Who knows, at 40, we may not know how to write songs anymore. I hope to have enough money to go in, into a business of my own by the time we um, do flop. And um, I mean, we don't know, it may be next week, it may be two or three years, but I think we'll be in the business either up there or down there for at least another four years. I've always fancied having a, a lady's hairdresser and sell them, you know, or string them, in fact. And, Trot round with me stripes and me tails, you know, like a cup of tea, madam. Well, I'm 18 and I've just given up my job as a, a trainee accountant to do this professionally and with a bit of luck, I think I should be able to come out with about, say, £10,000, something like that. You know, as long as this sort of money's in it, then chaps are just going to keep plunking on.